if someone is saying that viruses don't exist, uh, they, we should be replete with masses of evidence that they do. <laughs> we are replete with masses of evidence that they do exist. Uh, if I may say something uh, myself, let me tell you how I discovered the virus that I discovered. Uh, I was growing tissue culture from, it, it was it suspected that they, you know, they, they were cultures of spleen cells, and it, suspecting that there might be rabies around, what we call the rhabdovirus. But then I started seeing pathologies in those cells that could not be explained by rhabdovirus, that it, that had nothing to do with rhabdovirus. So it had to be something else. Now, were these cells intrinsically sick or what they had, could it be transmitted to other cell cultures? Which is the first thing I did. And yes, even after ultracentrifuging, the supernatant fluid that these cells were grown in could transmit the same pathology to other cell cultures. And I, what I was seeing was formation of giant sensitia, cells that would fuse together and become multinucleated cells. Now, in the literature, people have described viruses that cause that. They're called sensitium-forming viruses. And my virus was a sensitium-forming virus, but different from those that they knew before. Then, if it is a virus, I should be able to inoculate animals and create antibodies to it, which I did, and show that there would be precipitation of antigen antibody complexes in uh, gel diffusion, what is called gel diffusion. Then I illuminated those viruses by making fluorescent antibodies to them and then looking at them through ultraviolet uh, uh, microscopes. And you could see the points of illumination uh, my doctoral dissertation is online, by the way, if anybody would like to see it, even though back in 1978, they didn't do that. But in 2010, I received a letter from the University of Florida asking me permission to put my doctoral dissertation online because they wanted to show what kind of uh, uh, research was, was produced at the university pre-internet, and they digitalized my uh, my doctoral dissertation. So anybody can can look it up. And when you look at these illuminated viruses, these pictures are beautiful. They almost look like uh, uh, pictures from a, the Hubble telescope looking at constellations. Uh, then the next step was to do electron microscopy. And you do electron microscopy where, you know, because viruses are too small, that visible wavelength cannot see them. In other words, the wavelength of visible light is larger than a virus. So you needed something with very, very small wavelength, such as an electron, to visualize the uh, you know viruses and electron microscopes were invented and we see them and the way we know their size is that we have nano beads that we can put next to them and estimate their size that way another thing by what they call column chromatography you can see their density the density of the virus the other step, which became very current after the 80s, when uh, what they call polymerase chain reaction in 1984 was invented and received the, you know, the fellow who invented it received the Nobel Prize for that, then it became much easier to 
uh, sequence the genes of viruses. Now, so I don't think there's any doubt that viruses exist. They are genetic materials encapsulated in a viral uh, uh, envelope, which is mostly made out of protein. Uh, this has been done over and over and over again. Now, as far as viruses causing disease, we all know the curse of smallpox or poliomyelitis. We have sequenced, the, well, we have seen those viruses, we have sequenced them, and I don't think there's any doubt that they cause the disease, the pathologies that we name. Uh, I, 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 I don't see why people would say that viruses do not exist or that they cannot, uh, you know, cause disease. Okay, well, let me quote then from the film Terrain, uh, which has just been released in a two-part documentary. Uh, it explain, explores terrain theory, but it, it is actually only giving a specific view, uh, Dr. Andrew Kaufman's view and Cowan's view, uh, which is a model, they say, for health, Terrain theory is a model for health that works in symbiosis with nature to promote wellness and healing, free of a corrupt and flawed medical paradigm. Well, oh. uh, you see, there's nothing wrong with this statement. The, in general, there's nothing wrong. If they didn't add that, uh, you know, well, bacteria don't cause diseases or viruses don't exist, there's nothing wrong with that sentence because we do have now uh, medicine, the whole medical system based on, you know, money, many unnecessary procedures, etc. So, yes, there, there's uh, those who believe that, uh, you know, you can lead a very good, healthy life. Uh, by following, you know, certain principles without ingesting toxins and uh, keeping your state of mind uh, in an undepressed, unstressed uh, state, yeah, it will contribute to longevity. But there is no relationship between that sentence and saying that one microbes, whether bacteria or viruses do not cause disease, and that viruses don't exist. Well, the, the Terrain film says that Pasteur was wrong. What do you say? <laughs> Pasteur got uh, some of his experiments wrong, but Pasteur was absolutely right in uh, developing an attenuated rabies vaccine, even though he didn't know that it was a virus and not a bacteria. Something very interesting, when bacteria were first, you know, seen to be causing diseases, some diseases were being caused by something that people couldn't call a bacteria because it was too small. So it was given the name in French, virus filtrant. In other words, they went through the filters that normally stop bacteria. So viruses were first given the name virus filtrant. And that was the case for rabies. Uh, because you couldn't stop them with a regular filter and they didn't have filters small enough back then to stop a virus. Because remember, you can have millions of virus inside of bacteria. Uh, So I would imagine, you know, I, I don't see where they're coming from. One of the biggest studies concerning a viral disease was by Walter Reed. As you know, the biggest U.S. Army hospital in Washington, uh, well, in the environs of Washington, is Walter Reed 
medical center. Well, Walter Reed was a researcher, a ruthless researcher, who sacrificed soldiers and natives during the construction of the Panama Canal to study yellow fever. Now, he couldn't see the virus, he couldn't isolate it, but he showed that he could pass it, that it would grow in cells, and that it causes the disease. Uh, so I, 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 I really, I don't think there is a contradiction between, you know, what the people who believe in terrain theory say and what I believe in as far as big pharma giving us things that are unnecessary and even nefarious, medicine developing into a money-making machine uh, that does many unnecessary procedures are prescribed, and that is what by big pharma. And we all know about the opioid epidemic. It was manufactured by big pharma, prescribed by supposedly great doctors of medicine. And the end result is that thousands and thousands of people became addicted and thousands have died from... So, I mean, I know it's, a, it's an almost impossible question to ask, uh, uh, to answer, Stanley, but uh, at, at what point do you think the pharmaceutical industry got too big for its boots and started, rather than... Uh, you know, funding research into new techniques which would save lives, it started to concentrate much more on its shareholders and its profits at any cost. I think it started in the late 60s and 70s on a very small scale. And as they became, as they saw they could have political power, do you know that the pharmaceutical industry now has three to four lobbyists on each congressman, each company? For example, Pfizer has a, an average of three lobbyists for each congressman in the United States. And they saw that the power of money, that uh, as politics became how much money you had to 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 you know, carry on a campaign, Big Pharma saw its, uh, uh, that, that weakness and, you know, milked it to the, to the max. The two people who started this new wave <laughs> would be Reagan and Thatcher. The idea was that everything, you know, uh, corporations could do no wrong. Uh, gave them absolute power, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry or the military industrial complex. And it has gotten to the point where by the year 2000, it's been, at least here in the US, I don't want to speak for the UK because I'm not that informed about the UK, but here in the United States, I guarantee you that the FDA is totally controlled by big pharma when it should have been the opposite, that the FDA is, you know, uh, uh, controlling big pharma. Uh, 